Good morning. Ah, there we go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Lillian Ash Baker. I represent the Aerospace Village. I do the speaker CFP process. The Aerospace Village is in conjunction with the Creator Stage team is pleased to introduce Craig. He is presenting on an adversarial approach to airline revenue management. So please welcome Craig to the stage. So anyway, I can hold it. What's that? We hold it, thank you. Yeah, there's no way to <laughs> Well, hey everyone. Uh, I'm Craig. Uh, a little about me. I uh, I first moved into state for work about 15 years ago, and started flying a lot since then. Um, by trade, I'm uh, I work with uh, Splunk and Seam Tools now, but my um, background was uh, Cisco and carrier sort of networking stuff. But yeah, just. So firstly, what, what's this talk not about? So it's, I'm not all about uh, these big uh, clickbait, you know, sort of uh, travel articles where when really when you break them down at the end of the day, it's like sign up for this credit card, get a sign on bonus um, and, you know, pick the most expensive fare out there to, um, to advertise it through. So with that, just a little disclaimer, um, the, the audi intended audience, sorry. Oh, it's cut? Yeah. Okay. So just a little disclaimer. I guess uh, the intended audience for this talk is supposed to be, I guess, people at airlines or whatever, so they can defend their systems better, right? It's ethically. Um, but yeah, and with that, just some caveats. Um, look, I'm just a dude. This is an interest topic to me. I haven't been trained. I, I just sort of, you know, black box as I've got along and learned stuff. So hopefully I'm sharing that with you. Uh, there's a lot of information to cover, so uh, I'm gonna, uh, it probably will be a bit high level. Uh, come see me later, I'll get a copy of the slides if you like. But, um, yeah. So firstly, why is the uh, airline in and travel industry the way it is? Um, there's high fixed costs, it's very regulated. Uh, you know, not only do airlines have to get approval from, you know, both governments to operate fair flights between two countries, they actually have to, you know, apply for slots. And so these slots are sometimes like, you know, IP4 addresses where <laughs> it's pretty congested at some of the airports like London and JFK and whatnot. So in fact, in fact, uh, you see things like, I think Malaysia is flying almost empty planes to London just to keep their slots because if they don't use them, they um, they lose them, right? And, and they, they, they do trades and, they, you know, it's a 75 billion marks for one of the slots recently sold for. So with that, there's also this concept of uh, fortress hubs, which are like the big hubs of certain airlines that they have such a dominant hold on the market. So with that, what, what does the revenue management team do? And what they do is basically try and maximize the return they can get on um, by filling an aircraft. And what they're concerned about is either, uh, if we if you boil it down, so this is a, a bit of an academic science. This is quite a good, there's a few journal, there's quite a lot of journal articles and research on this. But for our purposes, if you, if you boil it down, really what they're trying to uh, look out for is making sure the seat, they get the you know, highest price for every seat, not letting it go empty or selling it out too cheap. Yes. So thinking about that, how, how, can they, how can they be disrupted? Now, we're not going to really talk about many of these uh, today, uh, but just wanted, to say, just wanted to highlight the fact that it ranges straight from... Uh, I guess using a same day flight change or some of your actual benefits that they offer in some ways can, you know, reduce the <laughs> return they would get, but in, in other things actually become more uh, related, you know, like fraud where it's credit card abuse and that sort of stuff or by cashing out things for gift cards. Um, so with that, how do fares exist in the world? Like, so when you, when you go to an airline website or, you know, your Expedia or whatever, what, what do you actually see and why, why does it come up that way? Um, I've often overheard people go, oh, the price went up because of my cookies or whatever. But generally you find there are things like, there are things called rules attached to them. There might be uh, days of the week or where the fair is published. And the other, the other concern is the dynamic inventory that's involved. So we'll talk a bit about that. As you can see, um, it's, extremely, it's extremely complex computationally. And uh, there is um, Carl to market of ITA, or originally of ITA, has written a very great, um, 
very great presentation on, on the, the computer complexity of actually calculating these things because uh, most international trips or where there's multiple connections, actually it can be tens of millions of possible connections of fares and flights and whatnot. So um, that's why sometimes when you go to book, it might say this price is expired because actually you're sort of looking at case uh, availability. Um, so what do fares look like? Uh, this is an example from probably one of the, the, the tools that you can sort of buy closer access to these, um, the actual, uh, like what a travel agent would see. It's not the same system, but it's like a, it's like a read only one that consumers can subscribe to. Um, but this is what you, this is sort of what they look like. So they all have like a, um, a basis or an identifier code. And now this code is a bunch of numbers, but I mean, sorry, a bunch of letters, but usually these letters indicate the first one is the inventory code. And the others, depending on the airline, might indicate the seasonality or other sorts of, you know, restrictions for a, for a family affairs. So this is some here. It's just an example for uh, London to New York. Uh, you can see the round trip. That those prices are actually the base fare before you add taxes and surcharges. Um, and there's, you can also see there things like the minimum maximum stay that they have. So uh, the SU is a Sunday stay, and it's an old sort of traditional concept that they used to catch business travelers with. Because if you if you forced uh you know leisure travelers are more likely to stay over a weekend whereas business travelers you know want to go home on Friday or whatever. Um, so as we as we talked about that, they're published on two sort of bases generally the uh, the routings basis where it's it's explicitly show you which which uh, which transit points and uh, you you can book with that particular fare, and um, the other way is the the mileage uh, or an MPM basis. Now, it, it, I've got a little calculation there, if you can see on the screen, of how an MPM sort of works. But essentially, um, it, it's using the great circle distance uh, the, that you, it, some of you may have seen with like impossible travel and whatnot um, alerts in your, your seams. Uh, and then, so that they can make it work through their particular hubs. Often, you, they have a concept of a ticketed point deduction, where basically you can get extra miles to finish the trip because they... Uh, because say, for instance, this one, they allow you to fly through Chicago. So just a brief thing, when you're combining these fares and looking at stuff, there's quite a number of rules that are involved. And we just sort of looked at the routing, but as you, as you can see there, and I did speak about that Sunday stay, but yeah, there's, there's all these other things to take into account. So behind the scenes, when you actually buy a ticket, it kind of looks like this. So I, had a, I did have a picture earlier of um, a Qatar ticket on there. Um, but this just shows a more complex sort of ticket where, um, well, at least, at least this is my understanding anyway. Uh, but the important thing to know is that when you get your reservation, uh, your PNR, your you know your six letter identifier, just because it says confirmed or on request or whatever in there, it doesn't actually mean you can board the the flight. You need a you actually need that valid e ticket uh, in in there. And th and then when you check in, that's when it actually marks the basically coupon. It's similar to the old paper tickets, but marks it as used. And these have to be used in order or basically your rest of your flights are cancelled. Just going back to that last one, we can sort of see there an example of where the, there's an issue with the e-ticket, even though you have a valid reservation and you can't, can't check in on that one yet. So moving across to the, uh, the dynamic, uh, how they manage dynamic inventory, you might have seen things like five seats less or whatnot, um, but essentially they use, uh, what they use is, is buckets which are given letters and they and the different fares will attach to different buckets and that that's how they sort of manage the pricing so if you look in if you look at that here's an example of uh here's an example in what would what a travel agent would see in what they call those G, the distribution systems that shows the availability for a particular flight this is a flight from dubai to london and what you can actually see on this one that's quite interesting is that because the, the Y is the highest price or fully flex economy, it's the highest they have, and also the generic term for that class. But what you can see, because it's zero, it means it's, it's like completely no seats to sail. And um, generally we know that they oversell by about 10 or 20% most flights, if they can. So with it being zero and closed, they weren't not taking any more bookings. But the other interesting thing is we're seeing nine, which is the maximum for a, a, at any one time, that it, if there are only single digits, um, so the actual business and first cabin on this particular flight is quite empty. So there's probably a chance that people will get there'll be a bit of a cabin roll and to fill to sell more seats and to fill it up. The, some of the um, more frequent flyers or people traveling alone might actually get uh, order, you know 
uh, when they go to the gate, might be given a new seat upgraded. Um, so moving on, how do we handle connections? Now with connections, it's the same sort of thing, but th what you need to keep in mind is your fare class or your availability needs to match for all segments. And not only that, you also need it for every person. So if you search for one person on this, uh, you would get you would, you would see uh, the cheaper like R fare for business. But if you uh, had two people, if you're going, it it would show a higher price when you actually search. And that's not like a cookie because you already search. It's because it's because this second connecting flight only has one seat available in that R class. So learning some of this can help you. Uh, piece together and understand like, oh, I found a good fare, I want to book this, which days can I actually go uh, and net really narrow it down. Um, so following the money, where it all goes and whatnot, basically there's a thing called a val validating carrier and that's the one that issues the ticket and that's the e-ticket database they use. Interesting fact is American Airlines is, has uh, all their serial numbers start with 001, but every, because they were the first uh, computerized airline, but all of, all of the airlines basically have one of these three uh, digit identifiers that for identifying which stock that is. Uh, you also have a concept of a marketing carrier. Now that's the flight number you buy. And so you might, if you've heard of a code share before or ever booked a flight like that, where you're like, um, maybe you've booked Finnair, but it's actually like a American or British flight. That's what a code share is. Um, and the operating carrier, obviously the metal that you're on. Um, so just an example, like to tie some of these concepts together. This is a little bit of an unusual boarding pass because it's printed by Aer Lingus and then on, and it's a it's an it's an American flight that was sold as British Airways. And but you can also see there with this electronic, there's the the longer there's the longer marking there with starting in 125, and that's the e-ticket that's the e-ticket serial number or number, right? The the 25 at the below there is is also like a sequence number of how, which, which, you know, the, the check-in or when they were at that, um, at the out station, when you sort of checked in online and, and when, when it went on the manifest. So having, having regard to the, those sort of concepts, I'll talk about some of the weaknesses. So why do you sometimes see those fares now for getting so low, like $1 or $15 as we saw before, is that a lot of the components now come up as, you know, carrier surcharges under this fuel surcharge that started in 2004. Um, so yeah, initially they're only like 20 bucks or something because the oil price was fluctuating. But then what happened was I guess the airlines realized they weren't, didn't have to pay at that time. They thought they didn't have to pay commissions and other things uh, on these uh, amounts. So so from my perspective, they, they kind of seem a bit like junk fees, like resort fees and stuff that you might pay at hotels. The um, interesting fact is that because of the way they're levied, it's actually it actually has become more complicated. The, the calculations have become more complicated. And one thing that's that's interesting to note is that the way and the way they're published, the, the validating carrier decides whether to apply it or not. It's not necessarily the airline that you're flying on. So this presented some opportunities to that, that, that could force you know errors could creep in. So as I say here, the it's, it's the S1 record is like a. It's just a database record that has, um, you know, the criteria for applying the surcharge and how much it is, but, um, you know, and when all the things it matches. So we'll, we'll go and the fact that it has like sequence numbers, it sort of works a bit like a firewall rule. So when we talk about exploits for this, uh, the the good old days, um, what people were doing for a while uh, was was that they were actually just going over to another airline's desk and getting them to book flights, you know, like a ticketing desk and getting them to book the flights for the other airline and have them issued by uh, one that didn't levy the surcharge. But there was an IATA resolution and that's kind of gone away. Um, but the more, I guess the more interesting ones and the more technical ones for us uh, and, and for defenders is is the way that the, those uh, S1 records work and and they apply it. So you, I've got a bit of an example here from one of the the from the apps code, the fair publishing manual there, right? So some of you may also be able to see why um, how these can sort of break or be pushed. At, you know that sequence can be skipped. So for instance, like and and it might depend on whether the fair actually has compa is, is compatible with other fares. But if it is, for instance, if all if the last one has if all ticketed points are wholly within the U.S. Well, what happens if you have a you know domestic segment in Canada or Mexico or whatever, for instance, right? Um, it, it wouldn't apply it, right? So, um, 
just a demo of this I can show you. This is this is quite an old one. Uh, people in the sort of travel community don't really like this stuff uh, shared, uh, but this is an old one. I, I found it interesting to try and even just get this to work, stuff to work. It's a bit like pen testing, but. This is one here where, where it's, a, it's a fare for $727, a normal return. What we, and with a surcharge of, you know, close to 60%. So what, what happens is if we actually add a, another segment that's compatible there and, and, and break that application, it will, um, you know, what you're doing is you're actually adding, you know, another fare on there and it's pushing the base price up, but because the surcharge was so low, it's actually dropped your price down you know, you've added a hundred pounds in this instance, but you've, you've lost, uh, it's, it's, you know, miscalculated the price by 260. Another thing that's, that's sort of interesting is the way, uh, because of the comp competitive nature of markets, how there is sometimes arbitrage opportunities, but this can be a bit of effort. Like you, you know, you might have to, you have to start your ticket there. So like, but sometimes it could be worth it. Like for instance, if you're in Hong Kong and you want, you, you know, you start your journey in Japan or you're in the US and you start it in Canada, but the, these things fluctuate and change. Uh, another thing to look for is some of these countries with unstable currencies. Um, some ticket, you know, sometimes they, or fixed exchange rates, for instance, Egypt uh, changed their official exchange rate by 50%. And there was some, you know, good deals that came out of that. For, for a period, but a lot of the other countries actually publish in euros or US dollars that have unstable currencies. So it's not a, it doesn't happen all the time. Another one that's, I guess, a bit, bit, bit more, another vulnerability that's, that's been a bit more popularized and talked about uh, over the last 10 years is, is the, uh, is hidden city ticketing. This is a, you know, a very well-known practice that's, you know, that, that all uh, airlines sort of hate, and, you know, bash up agents if they try and do it, right? But Essentially, you can see here, uh, if you're comparing this, this is a, you know, a Delta flight. You're trying to go to Atlanta, right? But if you look directly, it's going to be close to $200. But, but when, when a Nashville flight is tagged onto the end of it, it actually, you know, it's less than half. Now, the reason for that is, I guess, business customers want to fly direct generally. People pay more for a direct and whatever competitions in the different markets. So they want to fill those seats, but not do it. Um, the issues with these kind of things is that it is generally against the terms of conditions of carriage. Uh, and what they also do is if people are checking bags, they don't, they don't short check it to mid destination. That is of course, unless you have an overnight or longer layover. So if the fare is actually flexible, what, and you're, you could be totally within the rules by booking one of these and, ha and say, well, I'll go to Nashville for a weekend, you know, three weeks, you know, in three weeks, cause you live in Atlanta, for instance. So sometimes you can make these things work without, without actually, you know, breaking the rules. Another thing I'll talk about is uh, mistake fares. So sometimes you see things in the press. There's been a few good ones where, um, you know, they, they will, uh, you know, first class of 500 bucks return from Asia or whatever, because someone's either the, often it's either the route, the allowed routing has been, there's a mistake or the base fare has been uploaded incorrectly because it's still, I believe it's still kind of manual in a lot of ways. There's still a lot of spreadsheets that are used. So in the past, the USDOT used to be very uh, aggressive in enforcing this, this legislation on post purchasing price increase. But in 2015, what happened was there was a very large issue with United. That you, if you Google, you'd probably, you, you might be able to find some more information. But essentially, this issue was they published uh, in Danish Krona, they, they made a mistake where it was a divide by 1000 issue on the base fare. Now, this is because Dan it, it, the Danish Krona uses the comma as a decimal point rather than a, than a period, right? So the key thing to, to know out of this now is that, that they're, they're allowing airlines to e more easily get out of these, these fares if they demonstrate it was a, a mistaken fare. Now, one of the ways they would do that, I guess, is there's a lot of blogs and stuff that sort of try to pro prof profit off this. And yeah, so I mean, it, as Roaring Kitty would say, as for me, I like the fare, it's just a good fare. Because sometimes you don't understand, it's hard to understand, I guess, when they, you often see them publishing base fares of $1 for transatlantic flights, like how, how do you know necessarily? So if you're an airline, what could you do, right? So they have a thing called an agency debo, debit memo. Now that's, uh, uh, you can find the, those policies online as well. Most airlines publish them. And that also will show you sort of conditions of what they're actually looking for and how they go after travel agents that maliciously do stuff. The example of what a travel agent might do is 
hold stuff on a fictitious name. So like, you know, wait, you know, like how you can do free holds, for instance, they're basically holding the, the seats and then they without and then they cancel it and rehold it, you know. So they, they, they do chargebacks for that. And there's like like a credit card chargeback, there's like a processing fee attached to that. But I guess my other point is that they could kind of think like us, uh, you know, I think fraud teams and other teams could learn a lot from how what we the advanced detections and things we run in SOX, uh, because in a lot of ways, a lot of the detection stuff is similar and we're just used to uh, hackers and impossible travel and things like that. And sort of finally, if this, if you're interested by this, you want to know a bit more, um, it's great to be able to those, it, it's sometimes hard to get the same visibility into all these things that the, like a travel agent would, would get. But with the, with those tools like Expert Flyer that I showed before, KBS tool, they're like subscription ones where you can actually get sort of read-only access, but it's it's not 100% what you can do and they don't actually, can't support pricing. But another one that's great, that's really, really good is the ITA's matrix. So that, that will actually give you sort of a full pricing engine that you can, it was is basically the backend for Google, or was the backend for Google Flights at one stage. And what I like about that is that you can put really advanced pairing specs in there. So you can say only show me um, only use like for the calculation, only use fares or only show me stuff that's compatible with this particular fair basis code, um, lock it down to all that sort of stuff. And the even better thing is that you can actually turn off the availability checks because to get more better CPU use of your CPU time. So with that, um, I guess to say thanks for everyone. Um, I've got a few more things here if people are interested particularly recommend that the MIT, uh, I guess it was for a computing course, but that MIT's computational complexity of air travel planning, really, really good. Uh, and I would have liked to talk about that, but <laughs> I hope that's a bird's eye uh, overview. And if you have any questions, come see me at the bar or something. Good. Now, conscious of time, let's crack on. I want to talk today about electronic flight bags. But before we go there, a little bit about me. I am a pilot. I'm a really bad pilot. I've landed at the wrong runway before, so never fly with me. But I also am part of a, a company called Pentest Partners, where we do a lot of red teaming, but also a lot of embedded system work. We've got multiple pilots on the team, so we do quite a bit with airplanes. And over the last few years, we've learned how to hack or not hack airplanes. Before we start, though, it's really, really important that we disclose vulnerabilities in aviation responsibly. There's something about hacking planes that drives the media into a frenzy. You say plane hacking, they go crazy. And as a result, it damages industry, and I think it makes us less safe. My wife is a lousy flyer, so the last thing I want to do is make her more scared of flying. It does take a long time to fix bugs in aviation, and I'll explain why in a bit. But the most important thing you cannot do, you cannot hack an airplane sat in your, your seat in coach. It doesn't work like that. There have been some issues over the years with the media going crazy with stories about hacking airplanes. I'm not going to dwell on those. But before we start, how do you connect to an airplane? Well, there are lots of different interfaces. We all want in-flight Wi-Fi nowadays, but pilots have had that for years. You've got maintenance access. You've got uh, quick access recorders that now spin up over Wi-Fi. But just to prove that point, you cannot hack an airplane from the cabin. And the reason for that is we have really good network segregation in the bit in the back, the bit that we sit in. That's called the passenger information entertainment services domain, and we consider it to be dirty. Up front, we have the aircraft control domain, which is really secure, really well segregated, and completely isolated from the other networks. But the one I want to look at at the moment is the electronic flight bag, which is one of the systems the pilots use and connect to with connectivity. So what is an EFB? Well, last time you boarded an airplane and you looked left into the cockpit as you walked in, did you see the pilots had a tablet? Maybe it was a little computer, maybe it was an iPad, or maybe a, an Android tab. It's essentially a device that they use to make their operations safer and more efficient. So there's lots of different things that an EFB does. It's, for example, it has your roster, your passenger list, it has your weight and balance, so you can make sure the airplane is properly balanced and within its performance envelope. But most importantly, ooh, ooh, we're still there. I've just lost audio. <laughs> can we have a, there we go, we're back again. Most importantly, 
It also is used to calculate your calculate engine performance or perf. Now, performance, you might not appreciate this. It's very rare that we use full power when we take off. Really rare. And the reason we don't is we don't want to burn lots of fuel because it's expensive and bad for the environment. And we also don't want to wear the engines much. So if we use less power, if we've got lots of runway, or we're not very heavily loaded, we use a D-rate or a what's called a flex temp in Airbus or a D-rate with Boeing planes. And we calculate that using lots and lots of different data sources like the wind, the weight, the, the pressure altitude of the runway, all sorts of things that tell us how much power to use on departure. But before we go there, I want to look at some of the bugs, things that have gone wrong. Not hacks, just things that have gone wrong. Uh, there's all sorts of examples of things that have just gone wrong. For example, Ravenair, they used um, a digital maintenance system, and they got ransomed, and their backup got ransomed. And as a result of that, they couldn't prove the airplanes were airworthy, so they didn't fly. Uh, American had a lockup on their uh, electronic flight bags. Uh, there was a duplication in one of the Jefferson databases. I think they duplicated the chart, so the map of the runways, at Reagan National, and it caused the entire application to lock up, and a lot of airplanes didn't move that day. Southwest had a bug a few years ago. They lost their, their weather feed. Now, pilots, you can't just look out the window and see what the weather's doing. You need to know what it's doing up there and also where you're going. And you need that weather feed. No weather, no flying. They, a lot of flights didn't go. Mistakes happen with weight and balance as well. Uh, this is a really interesting instant. It's published. You can go and read it yourself. And the airplane type was changed at the very last minute from an Airbus A320 to an Airbus A321. Primary difference is it's longer. But the load sheet wasn't changed. All the passengers from the shorter plane were loaded at the front. And the airplane ended up out of balance. Pilot goes down the runway, tries to rotate on the stick, and nothing happened. There's not very much runway left. What do you do? You've passed V1. You've got to VR. You're not at V2, so you can't really fly away yet. So the pilot, very sensible um, individual, gave it full power, toga, and the airplane took off, primarily to do with the increased uh, rotation moment because the engines dangle off the wings. So they got away because they gave it full power. But yeah, that was a really very, nearly very, nearly serious instant. Another one to do with performance. This was a confusing instant that happened at Lisbon Airport. Now, there were some runway intersection markers. So quite often on the short haul flights, you might see they don't line up for the whole runway. They go from a, a displaced threshold, right? They, they run maybe halfway along the runway sometimes, and they don't need the whole runway, so it's quicker. But the intersection markings were a bit confusing. They'd been renamed. They were given temporary names. And when pilots were putting them into their flight bag to do their performance calculations from the engines, the calculator thought there was more runway than they actually had. So it said, hey, we need less power. We've got more runway. And uh, over a period of a couple of weeks, eight flights very nearly didn't make it out of Lisbon. Now, that was all fixed, which is great. Um, we lost our audio again. Hello. <laughs> audio. Yeah, there we go. We're back. Good. A uh, very interesting incident happened earlier this year. This was uh, Alaska. Uh, they had two tail strikes, so they hit the back of the airplane when they were trying to take off on January 26th. Amazing response. So within a matter of minutes, they realized there was an issue, had a ground stop. Awesome, awesome response from the airline. And what had gone wrong, there was a software bug in one of their flight bag um, applications that was miscalculating their load, therefore not enough power was going on. There was another one that happened on April 17th. They had a related application issue with weight and balance. But actually, I was really impressed just how quickly they responded to this. But things do go wrong sometimes. So this is an airplane that had a really nasty uh, tail strike, tore the backside out of the plane. And uh, yeah, uh, they didn't realize they'd had that tail strike until they tried to pressurize the aircraft, and it wouldn't pressurize. And there have very sadly been deaths. Uh, the picture on the right is from an instant report, uh, a crash that happened in uh, Canada. A very tired 747 freight crew miscalculated the amount of weight they had on board, and very sadly, the airplane never made it airborne, went straight through the instrument landing system, and sadly, burst into flames. A very, very sad incident. It also happens on landing as well. When we land in commercial airliners, we don't want to use too much brake, because brake pads are expensive. They're carbon fiber. We don't want to use too much. So we'll typically use an auto brake setting that's related to our weight, the length of the runway, the amount of headwind we got, all sorts of cool things. And this is Quito Airport, very difficult approach, surrounded by hills. And um, 
Overstressed pilots used the wrong auto brake setting from their calculations and overran the end of the runway. They chose auto land, so auto brake two, and they should have been using auto brake four. So where I'm getting to with all of this is, could you cause an incident like that as a result of a hack? And we found some bugs that we think could in certain scenarios. So the first major problem you need to know about, those computers, those tablets that the pilots are using, you might be really surprised to know about the quality of the lockdown on those devices. Sometimes we'll find EFBs with no pin, or the pilot's birth date, or on smaller operators, you find no MDM, no real lockdown. I mean, even some small operators have sent their pilots off to Best Buy to buy the tablet for themselves. Wow. But also, there's a lack of proper understanding. On the ground, cybersecurity experts, in the air, pilots, sometimes those interactions don't go so well. And good examples of that. Hey, let's use uh, Face ID. Let's use Face ID to make my EFB nice and secure. So it's really easy. Great. Unfortunately, pilots have a habit of wearing mirrored sunglasses, which does not work well with Face ID, I promise you. And the one time you probably need your electronic flight bag more than anything is when shit goes down. Maybe you have a depressurization event. You go to your electronic quick reference handbook, which is, of course, on your iPad, but you're wearing an oxygen mask because the oxygen's just flown out of the door plug. Not a good day, right? So we really need to think carefully about how we unlock things. So first of all, we've got problems with local lockdowns. And with physical access to an EFB for a short period of time, we found some interesting bugs. And I'm going to walk you through. One of the very first we found was in Boeing, OPT, Onboard Performance Tool. And this is the tool that's used to calculate performance. So you'll spit in a bunch of data, and it'll give you your V speeds, so V1, the point at which you can break and stop without going off the end. VR rotation. V2, the point at which you can climb away safely with only one engine. That spot between V1 and V2 is kind of squeaky bum time if it all goes wrong. Now, that's actually a photograph of one of Boeing's tools. They brought it along to RSA a couple of years ago. Really, really cool thing to do. Uh, and we discovered that the database had no integrity text. So with a few moments physical access, you could change the data. You could make the runway look longer than it actually was, and therefore it would spit out the wrong data. Uh, you could extend the runway, and then the V-speeds went wrong, and the pilots would use the wrong amount of power for departure. Good news. Boeing handled it brilliantly. I could not have asked for a better response to this vulnerability. It's kind of good news for Boeing, which I think they kind of need at the moment. I don't know. Uh, it was a really good experience. They responded to us really quickly. They acknowledged it. They gave us a call every month to say, this is how we're doing it, and said, by the way, it's going to take two years to fix it. I'm like, what? You know, Google Project Zero, that's 90 days, right? And you drop it like it's hot. Aviation's different. It took them a couple of weeks to fix the bug. It took them a couple of years to recertify the code. Because you can't just go and update aviation systems. You need to recertify them to make sure they are safe in absolutely every possible scenario. And that was fine. And they published it, and it was all good. They got it sorted. Another bug. This is a, uh, a semi-installed EFB. It was a kiosk and a 747 we looked at, and it was unbelievably poorly secure. So you could break out. Password was password. Great. Uh, there were two of them for redundancy purposes, but they were networked together, and it was easy to compromise one from the other. So that removed the value of having redundancy in a cross-check, because you could hack them both to spit out the same wrong data. Uh, this was funny. It had a USB port on it and a sticker saying not to use it. OK. <laughs> now, this vendor never, ever engaged properly. Um, actually, Boeing even gave them a bit of kick on our behalf. They, they intervened to try and help it along. Still nothing. And actually, after 18 months, we agreed with the Aviation ISAC, which is the industry's cybersecurity and sharing body, um, that actually it was reasonable to disclose in public once we told the airlines about it first. And they helped us do that. That was really cool. What about some new things? So we've done Boeing. Let's talk about Airbus. So this is Airbus NavBlue FlySmart LPG, LPC NG. There are more TLAs in aviation than there are in cybersecurity. LPC, less paper cockpit, NG next generation. NavBlue is a company that's been acquired by Airbus, uh, and we found a bug. Almost exactly the same as Boeing OPT. So you can tamper with the runway databases and make pilots use the wrong amount of power. So it spit out the wrong information, pilots do the wrong thing. So we started vulnerability disclosure. 
And you're probably looking at that going, that's 2021, Ken. Yes, it is. So we sent it to Airbus. They've got a great PCERT team. We sent it to them. They came back to us quickly. They replied to us after a month and said, yeah, it's the operator's problem. I'm summarizing about four pages of email here. That yeah, that's that's not our problem. That's that's for the airlines. Okay, that's a novel discussion. So we started going into some of the regulations, and I'm not going to talk about EFB regs because they're really complicated, but they are different around the world. Uh, EASA, European Aviation Safety Agency, um, has is actually fairly uh, robust on EFB regs. FAA is slightly different, installed. EFBs, completely different set of regulations to a portable EFB. And the Civil Aviation Authority in my home country uh, also has a different set of regs as well. So we look at, looked at the regs and found AMC 2025, an AMC additional means of compliance. And this is basically the regulation that you're supposed to follow when you're keeping your EFB software up to date. And it actually said you're supposed to do an integrity check. And that's the one thing we thought was missing. Great. So we had another call with Airbus and said, hey, we think you're not following the regs. And this was a really weird conversation where they said, we're not going to fix it because we've analyzed your vulnerability and decided that fixing it would be a product improvement. I've got that in writing. Long version, basically, we had a near argument with their um, engineering team. And they told us that it didn't matter because you'd have to hack both EFBs at once because pilots cross-check on both. Well, they don't actually, they use one. Typically one pilot will do the entry of the data, pass to the co-pilot, and they will verify the data entry, then make the calculation. And to prove that, most um, uh, planes now have a minimum equipment list that only requires one EFB. So that was a shame. So we pushed over the period of a year, and they came back and said, yeah, it's, we've evaluated it. We consider it as a product improvement, so we're not going to fix it. Okay. And then one of our friendly airline clients said, do you know what you could do? You could have a chat with the regulator. I was like, why didn't we think of this before? Have a chat with the regulator. So we spoke to EASA, who are lovely, by the way. And um, we said, we've got this vulnerability. And Airbus has said, they won't fix it. And I'm like, what do you think? And they said, hmm, I think we agree. And then miraculously, on 10th of April, it's been fixed. It's amazing what happens when you get the regulator involved, isn't it? So it has been fixed, which is great, which is why we're talking about it now. But why was it so hard? I think some of it is around some of the struggles between flight safety and engineering and cybersecurity, because some of those are competing interests. It's so critically important. Same problem we see in OT, cultural separations between cybersecurity and safety engineering. I think there was also a bit of a reluctance to acknowledge it. I, I've spoken to Airbus a few times about this, and they've never publicly acknowledged um, the detail of this vulnerability. And what's really weird is actually Airbus have got a really good reputation with their customers for being really engaging with them um, on cybersecurity. They've got test rigs, all sorts of stuff. It's actually, they do some really cool things. So we don't understand why we had to involve the regulator here. There's another bug we found. This was well handled by them. Uh, this is a slightly different set of the package. It's called FlySmart Plus. And the updater for the iOS app had intentionally had ATS disabled, so application transport security. They turned it off, which meant, weirdly, you could man the middle over Wi-Fi and tamper with the updates. And like, attacks over Wi-Fi, really? But actually, there's one odd thing about pilots, as they always stay in the same damn layover hotels every night you can guarantee that layover hotel is going to have a pilot from that airline in. So actually, you know where they're going to be. So maybe a Wi-Fi attack is a bit more plausible. Another one, um, so a Lufthansa. Uh, this is actually the Lufthansa systems part of the business that produce a really good charting application called eRoute Manual. It's used by, used by loads and loads of uh, airlines. And we had a very similar issue. Um, whilst they did um, have a, uh, an integrity check, uh, unfortunately, the key for that integrity check was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> nine, ten, twice. And so we flagged this to them. They said, yeah, that's great. We, get, we agree with you. We disclosed it to them. Uh, what it meant was you could tamper with, for example, approach plates. So you could tamper with, um, I'll walk you through this. So this is a how you approach uh, to an airport. So you are supposed to arrive at 5,000 feet at DME 14 to the BRA VOR. That's your initial fix. Your safety height's now 4,600 feet till you get to top of descent D at DME 
You then descend on 170 degree heading to a safe point at your final fix at 3,900, and then you can go down to your minimum descent altitude to the point of getting to the middle marker at DME 4, so four miles from the airport, at which point you either go around or you land. We discovered you could tamper with all those, so you could convince the pilots to go lower and potentially have a control flight into the ground. I hope that doesn't happen. They were awesome. It took them two years, but they were really good, really engaging, and uh, have since asked us out to give some talks to them. Yeah. So that is me and EFBs. I want to give a very quick rattle around airports next. The other side of things. Airports are incredibly complicated places with lots of really interesting things going on. Uh, we were asked by one, aviation, one airport sorry, to uh, look at their departure boards. We said, yeah, we've got bugs in those. We think we can inject our own flights and completely tamper with everything. They said, what a cool organization. They said, go on then. Put a flight on our boards. So we did. <laughs> but of course, that was just proving the point. We could have trashed that system, and then there would have been chaos at the airport. Runway lighting is also a major issue. We know of one airport where their uh, runway lighting controllers were airside, and then they expanded the parking lots, and they ended up landside. And then someone came along and stole all the controllers and the runway lights stopped working. Oops. These are really good fun. If you ever fly into Heathrow's Terminal 5, they use robot pushback tugs. Never got to have a go at them. Haven't managed to pen test them yet, but I'm really pushing uh, BA and IAG to see if we can have a pop. Really interesting devices. Uh, fueling's also a major problem. Uh, there's two primary providers. It's all API-based, all done through tablets. I think there's a really interesting set of research to be done there. And ground power is a major problem as well. I'm not going to talk about spoofing ADSB. I'm not going to talk about that either. But what I really wanted to get to here is, if you're doing research in aviation, please make sure you disclose it responsibly. Don't drop it like it's hot in the public. It's not going to be possible to fix that bug and publish it 90 days later. It's going to take a while. If you're struggling to get airlines or manufacturers to listen to you, there's a couple of really awesome routes you can go. So the Aviation ISAC will help broker vulnerability disclosure for you. If you're struggling too, the DEF CON Aerospace Village, we're over there, we help found it. We will help you as well. There's lots of really cool organizations that can help you disclose vulnerabilities to airline and get things um, fixed. Planes are very complicated. They have really, really important safety engineering in there. So it does take a while to get the bugs fixed. So just bear with whilst they fixed it safely and responsibly. It would be lovely just to push an update, wouldn't it? But the chance of blue screening a plane, should we just not go there? Anyway, that is me. I hope you found it interesting. That's my email. That's the firm I work for. We're over in the aerospace village if you want to come and have a chat. We've got a flight simulator to play with, but thank you so much.